Uh, well, we happen to have a Berkshire shareholder now joining with us, uh, uh, straight from uh, upstate or up, upper New York, I should or, say. Or Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut. <laughs> you can say that bad word. <laughs> uh, Mario Gavelli with us from Gamco. Uh, so, Mario, what do you what, what do you make of this? Well, look, the company's got 140 billion market cap or 200 billion market. It's a large company, very complicated, but not very complicated. It's manufacturing, it's insurance, it's the float, it's the investment. So who's going to run the manufacturing? Does it have to be run by one person? Why not split it up down the road? There are a lot of things we can think about. And as you know, in four weeks on April 29th, we'll be at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting and we'll host a dinner for a lot of uh, value investors that night, 150 of our closest friends. But are you more skeptical? Are you no. more, are, are no. you, are you, are you upset at all? The fact that, that this has happened the magic, and that the, the, the magic, lack of disclosure. Yeah, the magic in Berkshire has never been whether Ajit runs it or Sokol runs it or Abel or, or Mike Rose or who it is. The magic is, Berk, is Warren Buffett and how he allocates cash. And he's going to still be there, and it underscores one thing. At 80, you don't need hand-eye coordination to allocate capital. i got to ask you the question that everybody's talking about this morning. You're an influential guy. If you buy shares in a company, a lot of people say, Gabelli just bought. That's interesting to me. You've got a huge team of analysts, and they come to you, I would assume, with ideas, investment ideas. Uh, if you were to take one of those ideas and then later find out that that person had bought shares for their personal account, what would be your reaction? First of all, does it happen? And number two, well, what is money, your reaction? In the money management business, you have to make a, an under, you have to have an, a clear understanding that there are rules of, uh, on the road with regards to an analyst buying stock and then recommending it. So we have structures and compliance procedures in place that that doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. Uh, Within the framework of what happened at Sogol, I'll let you guys debate that. From my point of view, you have to understand the internal procedures of Berkshire, and I don't know what they are. What we did today was we find we called Bombardier to find out what that means for the NetJets order. We would call BBA Aviation, which runs the signature, and what they think about the fact that Sokol's not leaving. We would dig a little further into the notion of what he said with regards to looking at a utility company. Which one would he want to buy? Which one is he going to be elephant hunting? And what does that mean for Luber's oil? Bottom line, Berkshire is a huge aircraft carrier that is not going to be roiled over by a small little uh, uh, Somalian uh, dynamic. So, Mario, then the assessment is that Sokol leaving is not going to be this huge hole at Berkshire, then? No, it's going to be a lot of work to explain it and uh, not a big dynamic. Uh, let me just, uh, Meyer, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, so give me your take. Is it going to be a huge hole at Berkshire, though, the fact that he's not there anymore? No, I think in, as far as Berkshire goes, it's the, you know very decentralized, and most of the company's operations are going to continue without missing a beat. What my concern is much more on the valuation of the company. Hmm. The company's worth a material premium to where it's trading at. The question is mark to market what happens as opposed to what the intrinsic underlying value of the company. I don't think uh, Meyer would disagree that it's not going to have an impact on the intrinsic value. What he's talking about is the public trading price, I hope. Mayor, is, that, is that right, Meyer? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mayor, we mentioned earlier that Buffett made it clear that David Sokol for a couple of years has said, look, I'd like to move on. Uh, did you ever think that he was going to be the successor? I have no comment on who the successor was. I think the directors of the company, I really believe that people like Murphy would not serve on that board if Warren says to the world, hey, I have named a successor, and you guys know who it is. It's in your envelope. It's there. Now, I can't answer that. You'd... Have, Mary, have you talked with David no. Sokol before? You never met him? Oh, I met him at the Berkshire meetings, I would say hello, but uh, nothing specific. What did you ever? What did you think of him? No what comment. do you think of him? I, uh, you know, oh, come on. No, no, no point of view. No point of view on David. I'm uh, a any other I'm managers? An, I, I do uh, have friends, and our own firm does rent net jets, and so we've watched the change from Centuli to Sokol and what that meant in terms of how they operate. Okay. But you can't see uh, in terms of personality. It's not a personality business. A prince kissing a frog does not change the frog if it's a bad business into a princess. Okay, so uh, this is... The stock the, is down. I mean, it, it's so the it stock is, is down, down so why? It's down about 2%. So Mr. Right. Market always... Listen, just Mr. Market, it's, it's the Berkshire show today. 
Well, as I was mentioning before, Berkshire Hathaway isn't the only big succession story in the headlines. So is News Corp. James Murdoch one step closer to succeeding his father, Rupert Murdoch, at the media giant. And John, I know you've been tracking this for yeah, us. A story that broke uh, right at the end of In Loop yesterday. You know, you mentioned Warren yes. Buffett is 80 years old. Rupert Murdoch's 80 years old, too. He's only about six months younger than Warren Buffett. And so but he's that young. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so, again, it becomes this story of succession. And yesterday we learned that James Murdoch, 30 years old is going to come back to the new uh, to New York be the deputy chief operating officer uh, he's already playing a big role internationally right. who's kidding who but he basically takes on a bigger international title he's played a big role with B Sky B and that over the last few months and now we have the guessing game based on the family tree so we know that recently Elizabeth Murdoch came back into the fold because News Corp just bought her company Shine there is a shareholder lawsuit based on what they claim is nepotism. Right. She's a little bit older. And then, of course, Lachlan Murdoch, who you've pointed out, has not been with the company uh, in any significant way for a while, and who also held this deputy COO title back in 2005. Take Before away from, he left, essentially. Exactly. Take away um, from got that pushed what you out by, by some of the other lieutenants yeah. uh, at News Corp. Um, and the significant part of this, I think, is also that James is moving to New York, which yes. is the flagship here. Yeah, and we'll work with Chase Carey, a longtime media industry executive, Direct TV, who's been helping out Murdoch in a big way. And perhaps the idea is he can learn a lot from Carey and then step into a greater role. Mario? Chase Carey is terrific. And anyone working with him should be extraordinarily privileged. And Rupert clearly has control of the company through the voting stock. So, What do you think that Chase is going to teach James? I don't know if he's going to teach him anything. All he has to do is... Well, he's going to learn under him. Yes, way. and what does that mean? It means how do you allocate capital? How do you do deals? How do you think about the dynamics of the world in the uh, digital world? And we I'm not saying that he won't learn something also on the other side. Uh, you know, there was Sky, and uh, that deal is still in the pipeline. Right. The, the, right, the B Sky B you're talking about, yeah. right? Um, would you be okay? I mean, let's, let's put it this way. If James were to take over at News Corp, would you, would you keep your shares? Uh, let me think about this. At the age of 80, you probably have a life expectancy of 11 years. So 11 years from now, we'll figure that out. Rupert is going to be around for a long time. And Rupert has his own style. I mean, I'm not one that would have argued to buy in the minority interest of Sky. I would have rather used a different way of allocating capital. We own 12 million shares, so we're not a big player. Well, and, but, and I mean, 11 years, yes, perhaps, but I mean, 11 good years? You know, I mean, there's going to be some point where there needs to be a transition point earlier than that. Why? Though. Rupert has the gold. Look at Stanley Ho in, in, in uh, Macau. He's still keeping control. Let me, let me ask it this well, way. Well, but he's also in the hospital often. Yes, <laughs> you know well, that's I mean? a, Rupert is not. <laughs> um, with Berkshire, you said any number of names could take over, you'd still be happy. If it was James or, say, Elizabeth Murdoch, who would you be uh, happy you, you, you guys are you're in the wrong game. This is, uh, there was a play by Shakespeare, Much Ado About Nothing. Sorry. You're, I'm more interested in, are they, are, for the years that starts July 1st, 2011, Will Murdoch be able to earn $1.35 a share, which we're estimating, versus $1.05 for the current year? What does it mean for Sky? Those are more relevant than... Okay, so what does he need to do then? What does he need to do to drive the shares then? Enhance the shareholder value? Well, that's a different issue because it really comes down to where Rupert, when he has allocation of cash, what does he do? Right. And how does he put it there? And I'm not a happy camper with regards to, uh, you know... Uh, the purchase of Sky, the leverage there, some other analysts are because they see another dynamic. When they look up in the sky at night, they see stars, and those stars are satellites, and those satellites belong to the sky. That's why we like DirecTV, and we were just visiting a company yesterday that puts up satellites and has orbital space. What is going on in broadband by satellite? And we still So you don't want News Corp to do a big splashy deal, because like many media companies, it's got a ton of cash right now. No, you know, they don't. They're not pro forma for the deal with Sky. If the, depending on the price they pay, and uh, whether they buy in the balance, the leverage is uh, is uh, not as uh, under leverage as you might have commented. Well, Honeywell CEO David Cody has advised President Obama on the economy, including the all important topic of jobs. Here's what Cody told Bloomberg contributor Judy Woodruff about what he wants the government to do. 
I've always found that a bit of the uh, irony of listening to government folks, uh, whether it's in the Congress or the administration, talk about how they're creating jobs. Because at the end of the day, government doesn't create jobs unless they spend our money. What they can do is create jobs by having an environment that causes people to want to hire. That's the one thing the government can do. And I wouldn't mind seeing more of that approach that just says, let's recognize that government isn't creating jobs. Rather, it's they're creating an environment where jobs can be created. That's a key distinction, the environment for where jobs can be created. Cody also said that he believes the economy has been improving and will continue to strengthen in the next three to five years. Back with us, back with us of course, is GAMCO chairman, founder, and CEO, uh, Mario Gabelli. What do you make of those comments? Well. You know, we're the large shareholders of Honeywell. David Cody's done a terrific job of allocating capital, mm. and he's got one of the early ones to take on the green movement and basically make us energy efficient. And I, you have to agree with him, and if I'm President Obama, you know, in April of last year, the market took a little tumble, and that was one year ago, not only what happened in the Gulf of Mexico but and, and in Greece, but he was bashing business. Come after the election, he became a Republican. So Obama <laughs> now wants to, wants to become reelected. And so as a result of that, he's finally understood that Jeff Immelt and David Cody and other CEOs are the ones that take risk and create jobs. And how do we allow them to compete effectively against the global titans that are being created in China, Russia, and India? And so creating the environment to create jobs is very appropriate. And I'd have to echo, uh, he's 100% correct. He's right correct. about that. Oh, I would say so. Do you think that the environment is there to create jobs, that we've reached that point? I mean, I know we are creating jobs, but... Well, I spoke to, I read, this time of year, you get lots of annual reports. I happen to read an annual report of a little company in Humboldt, Kansas, and the company is called Monarch Cement. And we own, we bought 200 shares yesterday, so I'll give you full disclosure. Okay. It's, and don't buy it, it's $25 a share or something like that, it's very thin. But in speaking to the CEO, he said, Mario, and I talked to him once a year, and it's, he's got a good handle on what's going on at grassroots. He said, X number of dynamics occurred from the EPA five years ago and today Y number. It is costing us so much money to comply with these that we can't focus on job creation. So mm -hmm. is it the reg is it the Obama himself saying X or is it the regulators? The Durbin Amendment, the Sarbanes-Oxley, the whole screw of, uh, group of regulation that came in uh, to uh, the, uh, the government a year ago. Right. How do we unwangle, uh, untangle that and how do we work our way through that? So are you saying that until we get all of those issues resolved, we're not going to see a recovery of the job market back to Well, there are a lot of structural reasons. No, no, well, unemployment at 6-7% isn't so bad either. Clearly, uh, you have a comp competition with the rest of the world that wasn't there. You have no child left behind, but no adult left behind. We have to re-educate. We have to retrain. We have to put money into infrastructure. So it's just more than just getting up and being a cheerleader. Otherwise, I could be a great cheerleader and try to create jobs. That's important. Everyone, for example, in the United States should say, hey, let's get back to basics. Save 20%, go out and buy a house. This is the greatest time to buy a house because inflation's going to take hold. Yes, we should reduce entitlements. We should make the world feel more comfortable that our debt will become under management. Mm -hmm. Right, all of that before right before the economy continues and, 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 and paces back to that recovery Betty, and, that, that the, we saw. The, the, the economy is doing well. It, it is doing well. But I it's, mean, it, it's still shaky, though. I mean, you know, the housing market still No, you know, still I think the, the biggest concern for me is going to the gas tank, uh, gas station and filling up my tank, and what kind of a shock does that have and what we'll have over it. Food and fuel are more important than housing, which will recover next year. Mario, give me your 30-second uh, take on the market. The market uh, has overcome a lot of hurdles. It had the pullback that we expected, not for the reasons we expected. And the super pumper, the super pumper, the Fed, is still out there helping keep the ballast up, and it's working. And the only concern I have is what happens in the next two weeks when we see consumer spending for the month of March mm. because of what happened at the gas pump. Food and fuel are very regressive and psychologically very debilitating. We'll see. But the markets are okay for the year and we'll make money. And as for what we'll be watching today, we've seen a little weakness in the pre-market. The jobs numbers, jobless claims relatively encouraging. In Europe, some concerns about inflation that's weighing on European stocks. Tonight we're supposed to get some data out of China on manufacturing. You put those three together and you have to do a little bit of dancing. But for right. now, I guess we're looking at uh, baseball at the... Uh, 
Stock right, Exchange. Mario's going to the Yankees game later. By the Are way. you? Opening day. We've done that as a for the last 15 years and. I want to continue that. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, Laura is down at the New York Stock Exchange grabbing a Budweiser. I don't know. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Not quite just yet. Uh, I do want to point out, uh, you know, after rallying yesterday, not seeing a whole lot of movement here today. Uh, the Dow, little change. Inching closer, though, to a fresh high for the year. Uh, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq also uh, under a bit of pressure. So not doing a whole lot. Traders say, you know, don't be surprised if the market takes a bit of a breather. Of course, waiting for tomorrow. Tomorrow's big March jobs report. Also, traders say here it's the end of the month, end of the quarter. So don't be surprised also if you see investors kind of taking in some profits here after the gains we've seen. But as I mentioned, uh, with the end of the quarter, you have new money coming in, uh, and that really could help keep this rally going here. So this idea that investors are kind of shrugging off those negative headlines, that trend may continue. Uh, also, keep in mind April historically tends to be one of the best months of the year for stocks. The Dow on average has posted uh, more than a 2% gain in the month of April. Uh, that's dating back over the past 20 years as well as the last 50 years. So uh, the bulls have history on their side. Back over to you. They do. That's what Mario was just talking about as well in terms of making money this year in the markets. Uh, let me head to Chicago first so with Todd Colvin joining the conversation with us of MF Global. And, you know, uh, Mario, confident about the economy. He says, you know, we're going to make money this year. You think so, Todd? I agree. I, I think, and I like Mario's comments about food and, and, and gas. That's really going to be a tax on the consumer. So it will be interesting to get those March consumer spending numbers. But I think today is really about position squaring. Uh, the jobs number has been the focus for about the past 10 sessions. We've seen Treasury yields rise. We've seen stocks rise, albeit on low volume. And I think the culmination tomorrow is the market's really expecting a 200, 220 number on the non on the private payrolls. And if they don't get it, you could see those, uh, those moves we've seen over the last 10 days reverse them. I, look, I feel like there are two views on the market right now. Mm -hmm. Mario talked about the cautionary point that at some point the Fed has to turn off the tap, but people keep saying earnings, er people who are bullish keep saying earnings. They're going to be good. That makes valuations attractive. Uh, and at some point, these two stories can't both win, I would assume. At least, you know, next few months, somebody's got to win that story. Yeah. What do you well, think? as we're sitting here next year on April 1st, 2012, looking into 2013, you've got to say, how is the world going to look? So where does the market start discounting? Right now, it's not a discounting mechanism. Right now, it's basically helped by the amount of liquidity in the system. And the Fed's super pumpers continue to pump. When is that turned off? When is the money going to stop flowing out of fixed income into equities? And Did that makes you bearish? A year from now? Sure. Yeah. I, not bearish, I, opportunistic. Okay. If I'm looking into 2013, there are a lot of really red lights flashing right now. So, as you learned in hockey, <laughs> and from Wayne Gretzky and you guys from Canada, because he's from know Canada. It, that's it. You don't go where the puck is, you go where it will be to make a lot of money, okay? And uh, I'm thinking about a year from now, what will be going on for 2013. Short term, you've got a lot of very good things happening, including deals. Look at what Luber's oil. You, you, Warren Buffett was, Warren, a savvy buyer, was willing to pay 30% above last tick to mm. buy it. Cephalon, uh, Valion, was willing to pay a significant premium. That underscores how cheap individual companies are to okay. buyers. Todd, last word on that? Yeah, I agree, and, and I think also adding to this uh, in, you know, rally in the stocks and sell-off in fixed income is that zero interest rate environment. Remember, if you've got to get yield, you know, getting a sub-1% two- or three-year isn't the place to do it. Get into the stock market. They've got good dividends, good yields, and we're seeing the stocks continue to go up. So I think that's, that's definitely the play in the short term. Okay. Thank you, Todd, and also to Mario for stopping by. Mario Gabelli, the CEO of Gamco. And